This is the Power Break Podcast number 185, titled, Who Do You Love? Hi, everyone. I'm Bob Brubaker, along with JT, as we hope you'll stay tuned for a little bit of a power break as we seek to give you a little power in this break as we help you succeed in the race of life. This is the Power Break Podcast with a focus on the spiritual, the mental, and the physical aspects, all to help you succeed in the race of life. For show notes from today's podcast, go to BobRubaker.com and follow the link for the Power Break Podcast. It's so nice to see you're the one who like choked on words instead of me at the beginning of the choked podcast. Choked on words? What are you talking about, man? <laughs> that wasn't your normal smooth, man, but it just proves that you're human, Bob. And Well, that, that is. You know, I was yeah. so excited to get begin to the uh, program today with JT and I just kind of lost my track of thought and my train of thought. Anyway, the train, <laughs> on, the, the train on the track got a little bit lost. So JT, what did you have for breakfast this morning? What did I have for breakfast? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Talk about a distraction. Um, I had oatmeal and I actually had some pork that I made two days ago, which was delicious, by the way, because we all know that JT is a man of meat. He enjoys yes, right. r- smoking things that were once living and walking. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, that was it. That was it. How about you, man? What you, what you have for breakfast? Uh, I've been having bulletproof coffee in the morning. So I had bulletproof oh, coffee this morning. Oh, that's good, yeah. man. That's super yeah. smart. You're getting all kinds of, like, fatty acids for your brain. So you, yeah. so you should be focused. But for some reason, man, you uh, it, it wasn't your normal out of the gate. But we're we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Yeah. We're, we're back at the gate. Well, speaking of the gate, let's open the gate of Thanksgiving and thank our listeners for joining us for the Power Break podcast. Thank you for listening today. Thank you for listening to the podcast and also sharing the link to the podcast with other people and telling others about the Power Break podcast found on most sites that uh, uh, where they, you can find and download podcasts. And while you're there at those sites, please leave us a rating and or a review. It really does help. And that's why we want to say thank you right off the bat. Yeah, we appreciate it. Uh, and over and over again, it's a humbling thing. And, you know, I just hope that we continue to be able to put out resources that help people because that's really what it's all about. Because I think we're going to really focus on that today, aren't we? We really are. And we're talking, who do you love today? So, JT, let's talk, uh, let's talk up, and up close and personal with you. Give us the story of you and Amy. How did you meet And how'd you know that she was the right one for you? Uh, Maybe tell us about your wedding. Give us some facts about JT and Amy Trevino. Wow. Um, Yeah, so uh, we were both law enforcement officers at Largo. Um, She had actually started... Uh, I was actually running the training program. That was when I first met her was when she went through the training program and uh, we got to know each other pretty well. And, um, you know, it was one of those where we always wanted to keep things professional. So there was always that thing in the forefront of both of our minds. But it was pretty obvious that we both really liked each other. So Mm. um, so fast forward, she gets out of the training program. I'm no longer her boss. I'm I'm a police officer. She's a police officer. That was when uh, we started the date. So, um, yeah, it was really cool. We met there. And then, you know, it. I both of us are a firm believer that, you know, you really need to keep some separation work and, and home. You need to be the same person. You know, you shouldn't be one person, one place and one person, another, but there should be some mm-hmm. separation there. Cause it's a lot, cause it's a lot healthier. So we always went out of our way to work opposite shifts of each other. Um, you know, we kind of hung out with different officers, but, um, and then eventually she ended up becoming a, a federal agent and she moved on, which was great because then, you know, you, we could, keep our work life and our home life separate. And it was a lot healthier that way. Um, you know, and we didn't have to worry about all the, I don't know, the the rumor mill stuff. So, but it was pretty obvious to me that Amy was the one because there was a piece there. Um, Ah, yeah. yeah, yeah, it was, um, you know, most of the people that I dated, there was a lot of drama. Um, there's a lot of drama in the world period, but, um, you know, people are really scarred over certain things. And, and, you know, Amy and I's scars, I guess, uh, were worked well together because there was no drama. There was a lot of peace and there was a lot of, um, 
you know, just similarity. We're, we're very, uh, her, her strengths really enhance my strengths and vice versa. So, um, yeah, our wedding was awesome. It was in Chicago, um, which is where Amy grew up. And, uh, man, it was, it was absolutely awesome. I loved it. Um, the, just our dear friends flew in for it, you know, because neither one of us live in Chicago anymore. <laughs> so, Ooh, yeah. so ev- yeah. everybody who wanted to go had to fly there. Um, so it was really pretty small and it was really about friends and it was really, um, yeah, it was just great. It was really good. You know, don't get me wrong though. You know, in, in our relationship, we were like everybody else. We had good days, bad days. I would say we probably had good years and bad years. Um, cause we've, we've been married now for 15 years. We've been together now for almost 20. So, so yeah, looking back on it, I'm like, wow, how about you, man? Tell me about you and Jan, man. You guys are like the coolest <laughs> couple ever. Every time, every time we go down to Florida and get the opportunity to hang out with you two, man, it's just, we leave like feeling like, wow, you know, we want our marriage to be like that. We want to have that kind of closeness and, and you guys just compliment each other. So what about you and Jan? How did you guys even meet? I don't think I've ever heard this. Well, it's interesting that, uh, we always say that our friends set us up and actually it happened before that, that, uh, I was working at a little radio station in Orlando and Jan and, and, uh, and her family were growing up there. She grew up there. And, uh, one night Jack Wurtson was going to speak, uh, at their, their church Jack Wurtson had the Word of Life program on the air, and he had it on our radio station. So a friend of mine who also attended that church uh, asked me to go with him to that church to see, hear Jack Wurtson. So I did, and I met Jan that night. And the next uh, couple of nights after that, uh, my friend invited Jan and me to his house. They kind of set us up. <laughs> so, wow. Uh, well, there you go. And then, uh, you know, we, we really found a connection and uh, we also wanted to honor Jan's parents because we felt like we wanted to get married and talk to her parents about that. They said, no way you put that off. And so we wanted to honor <laughs> her parents. And so we, uh, we, we didn't fight them on that. And then we talked to them another time and they actually brought it up. And again, they said, uh, no, no, put that off, put that off. And then one day, uh, it was like, uh, I think in 1973 or anyway, I was working at the radio station and on the air and Jan's dad called me on the hotline. And so I, off the air, talked to him and he said, uh, Jan's mother and I have decided that you two can get engaged anytime. And, uh, you know, anyway, so, uh, <laughs> That's awesome. so that night, <laughs> uh, I, I, I proposed to Jan and she said yes. And so the next day is actually Thanksgiving in our church uh, that we were at. Uh, um, we started this new tradition of having a Thanksgiving pancake breakfast and we were the head of the we we led that and uh, of course it was opportunity for jan to tell everybody that she was now engaged so we were uh, uh, married awesome. in, on june the 15th 1974 and uh, really thank the lord that he has blessed us uh, as you mentioned you know the the definition of a marriage is uh, uh, two sinners living under one roof. <laughs> so you yeah. have to work out the kinks, and you need God to uh, God's help to do that. And uh, very thankful that we have grown in our marriage, and uh, uh, we find the Lord's uh, delight for each other in each other as He has blessed our marriage to grow. So I give thanks to that. And next thing you know. Uh, you know, we're not too far away from that 50th wedding anniversary in a couple of years. So, man, that's so cool. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> anyway, uh, the love that is true love is based upon commitment, not emotion. That's what we're talking about today. And who do you love? And it's based on First Corinthians chapter 13, verses four through seven. Read this way: Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things, and endures all things. That's a call for commitment. So today, the consideration is, who do you love? Man, let's continue to talk more about that as we turn to your blog. And, you know, there was uh, my second 
JT's corner was actually about love as well, and it goes into detail yeah. about this. So, you know, there's a, there's a whole lot of love going on around here uh, <laughs> in celebration of St. Valentine's Day. Um, yeah. But, folks, if you haven't been over to the website, it's been totally redone. New resources, JT's Corner's there, uh, as well as Bob's blog. And you can sign up to get Bob's blog. Bogs? I was, must have been thinking of Wade Box, who was at one point my favorite baseball player. But you can sign up for Bob's blog at the website. It comes every Monday uh, free of charge, and uh, it's a great way to start your week. But let's continue to talk more about who do you love. Well, as our minds turn to the subject of love here in February, about this time of the year, we would also uh, be good to rehearse some things about love from a biblical perspective. As I mentioned, true love in the Bible involves commitment rather than feeling, although we hear the expression today of falling in love. The truth of the matter is love is a forward action based upon commitment to an individual rather than falling backwards into an emotion or a feeling. Based on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as you'll read verses 1 through 7, it's all about that. And as I mentioned that in in the blog, the famous words from 1 Corinthians 13, you hear oftentimes at wedding ceremonies, you'll notice that the actions, uh, but first dispelling the things that they appear to be good but are not without commitment and true love. Because true love, as described in 1 Corinthians 13, is based on commitment. So notice what is listed in outward demonstrations of being able to speak with languages or having an understanding of knowledge of all things, even faith that could move every obstacle away. If you don't have love, you're actually nothing, says the Apostle Paul. And if you seem to be so dedicated that even martyrdom was part of your life, if you don't have love, you're really nothing. Right. So practically speaking to couples from these words are very clear that even if you can express uh, another person with your or impress another person with your background, your abilities, your gifts and your promise that seems so good. If you don't have love that's based on commitment, you have nothing. Couples need to be very cautious when someone says, I love you, especially if that saying does not include a commitment to follow through. Jesus made it clear by saying, I love you, Jesus, is nothing unless you follow through with what he says to do. Like right. John chapter 14 says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. In Luke chapter 9, he says, if you want to come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. So back at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as we notice those commitments that is patient and kind and, and does not boast, is not arrogant or rude, it does not insist on its own way, is not irritable or resentful, does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth and will bear all things and believe all things and hope all things. As I go on, I talk more about that and then came to the conclusion of the article. And I want to read this to you today because uh, I've been part of weddings ever since I was ordained in 1983, uh, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I like to use something uh, that I've taken when Jan and I first married. I was working at a little Christian radio station in Jacksonville, Florida, and I heard this recording of a, what is called the Marriage Prayer. Not sure of the author or the artist, but uh, found it on the internet. It's been uh, used many times, but uh, I found that reading this prayer is really uh, an expression of what love is all about. I've used this in wedding ceremonies, which has always been a, a blessing to all presents. And it goes like this. O God of love, thou hast established marriage for the welfare and happiness of mankind. Thine was the plan, and only with thee can we work it out with joy. Thou hast said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helpmeet for him. Now our joys are doubled since the happiness of one is the happiness of the other. Our burdens are now halved since when, they are sh- when we share them, we divide the load. Bless this husband. Bless him as provider of nourishment and raiment and sustain him in all the exactions and pressures of his battle for bread. May his strength be her protection, his character her boast and her pride. And may he so live that she will find in him the haven for which the heart of a woman truly longs. Bless this wife. Give her a tenderness that will make her great, a deep sense of understanding and a great faith in thee. Give her that inner beauty of soul that never fades, that eternal youth that is found in holding fast the things that never age. Teach them that marriage is not living merely for each other. It is two uniting, joining hands to serve thee and give them a great spiritual purpose in life. May they seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and the other things shall be added unto them. 
May they not expect that perfection of each other that belongs alone to thee. May they minimize each other's weaknesses, be swift to praise and magnify each other's points of comeliness and strength and see each other through the lover's kind and patient eyes. Now make such assignments to them on the scroll of thy will as will bless them and develop their characters and as they walk together. Give them enough tears to keep them tender, enough hurts to keep them humane, enough of failure to keep their hands clenched tightly in thine, and enough success to make sure that they walk with God. May they never take each other's love for granted, but always experience that breathless wonder that exclaims, Out of all this world you have chosen me. And then when life is done and the sun is setting, may they be found then as now, still hand in hand, still thanking God for each other. May they serve thee happily, faithfully together until at last one shall lay the other in the arms of God. This we ask through Jesus Christ, great lover of our souls. Amen. Isn't that good? Wow. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. And you have no idea who wrote it? No, there's well, no credits given to that as I've searched for it on the internet. But uh, it is a, uh, I like to use it in wedding ceremonies. And usually about the time that I do that, everybody's about, about ready to shed tears. <laughs> oh, yeah, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I know, you know, chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians is probably the most quoted thing in weddings, probably in history, I would guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I've, I've never heard that before. That was beautiful. Yeah. Anyway, it's called the marriage prayer, and 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 the article is you'll find it uh, with the marriage prayer. Uh, you'll find it. Who do you love? At the the article, the the blog is found at bobrebecker dot com. So what's happening, Bob? What are you? Or what are you? What are you doing? What, what am I you? doing? What, what am I doing, doing is more accurate. <laughs> um, what would you like the listeners to know about this week, my friend? Uh, the book that I think it would be appropriate to talk about today would be called Strength Training for Your Love Life, something that Jan and I put together that is, uh, includes some practical application, uh, kind of a 30-day challenge, but I think we made it into a 40-day challenge, if I recall right. Anyway, Strength Training for Your Love Life, one of the books that we have at the uh, books at bobbrewbaker.com and the resources there. Check it out, Strength Training for Your Love Life. And while you're there, check out the sermon links of the sermons I preach here at Christ Community Presbyterian Church in Clearwater, Florida. And uh, we're wrapping up at this time when this is on. The, we have wrapped up the book of Acts. And uh, we'll be going on to First Peter in just a couple of weeks. Anyway, check out the sermon links and the books and all the other resources at BobRubaker.com. This is the Power Break Podcast. I'm JT along with Bob Rubaker. And this is time for questions and answers on the podcast. If you have a question for me or Bob, feel free to email me at jt at bobrubaker.com, and we'll get to answering those questions on an upcoming Power Break podcast. You know, Bob, I I even wonder whether that thing still works, because all I get is like, you know, some Egyptian prince wants to give me like $3 million or something, but I can send him $2,500. <laughs> That's like all I get at, at Bob Rubaker, or JT at okay. BobRubaker.com. It's okay, killing folks, me. folks, we're putting out the appeal. Please write to JT today. <laughs> JT yeah. at BobRubaker.com. Don't try to sell me a extended warranty for my car either. I don't need it. Thank you. Anyway. <laughs> all right. So question number one, from the spiritual side of life, is it possible really possible because man does paul go into detail about what love is and it's all action so is it possible to really love as we find described in first corinthians 13 right off the bat you would say not without the help of god if two people will love god as he is to be loved and they are committed to loving each other as he describes that love in first corinthians 13 then it's really God's love flowing through each of the people involved in the relationship. And that would be the only way. Listen to these words in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I love how this sounds. I share this in premarital counseling all the time. It says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe unto him who is alone when he fails, or falls rather, and has not another one to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. And then God adds this last phrase that says, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Notice, 
Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 2, 2, 2. It's all better with two. But then he says, right. oh, a threefold cord is not e- easily broken. That means the threefold includes God. Uh, and when awesome. God is in the relationship, when each of the people in the relationship seek after God first, then it's amazing how that carries into making that relationship even deeper and stronger. That's why he says in the book of he- uh, Genesis chapter 2, when when God took the rib out of man and made the woman and brought her to the man, it says, then the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then it says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It means that there always is a wonder in that marriage. They keep that wonder out of each other, in each other. And secondly, they're willing to push aside the things that normally would be so important because you're really focused on one another and also becoming one flesh means that they are devoted to one another and then it says they were both naked and ashamed in other words there's intimacy in the marriage when they're both uh, committed to doing what is right uh, by their marriage so it is possible when god is honored in the marriage as he is number one in the life of each of the each of the members the husband and the wife It's a growing process, but the key is commitment to the standard of God. Man, that's so good. You know, it's over the years, we have become um, uh, believers in a different definition of what love means. You know, when I was doing my article, um, What's Love Got to Do With It?, I went to uh, Webster's Dictionary and I looked up the definition of love. And the, there are two definitions <laughs> listed. The first one is more consistent with biblical principles. It talks about, you know, um, commitment to other people and things like that. But the second one, I would have put under the definition of lust. It basically said a an emotion uh, usually be, uh, based on physical sexual attraction towards another person and it's oh yeah like it's it, yeah to me that's not love i understand that a lot of people believe that is and i think that's a real big source of confusion for us especially when people decide to marry each other people decide and they do it based on that which is more of a lust feeling that will go away a hundred percent um but that's got nothing to do with the love that Christ talks about. You know, I love after the resurrection when Christ says to Peter, do you love me? And he says, mm-hmm. of course I do, my Lord. And he says, then feed my sheep. He calls him to action right after it. He says, right. if you love me, you will act according to that love. So really there's there's an evidence there based on your action towards other people. Um, and there's an and that's described in in First uh, Corinthians thirteen. It's that action. There's a description there, so it's actually a call to action. Love isn't based on emotions; it's based on action towards other people, right? Um, Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and man, do we have that so confused? And I think that's the reason why most marriages nowadays are doomed for failure. It's because it's based on the wrong definition. You know, if you just say. You know, if we looked at it honestly and say, oh, yeah, you know, I lost after that person. I, 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 th- I think you'd be, you know, even though that doesn't sound good, that's really what you're doing a lot of times. Right. Yeah. And being yeah. honest, being honest with the situation. But I just yeah. want to point out that even if a person got into a relationship on that basis, there's still hope because uh, a, a person can go back to what commitments God requires of us or calls that's us correct. to. That's correct. Yep. And going back to those commitments. And so, so there is help, and that's what we're talking about it today. Yeah, for sure. All right, so question number two from the mental aspect. So how do we avoid the mental trap of expecting too much from our spouse? Because we do, um, and I have some definite reasons in my head as to why in my own experience that's happened. But, um, you know, how do we avoid that mental trap? Because it, it, we can fall into that pretty quick. Well, if we took an honest look in the mirror, (laughs) we would see our own faults, right? And that mirror is not necessarily a physical mirror, but also the mirror of God's word. And realize that marriage is not two perfect people trying to outdo one another. 
uh, but two sinners under the same roof relying upon the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit as he takes the word of God and applies it to each uh, member of the marriage individually and collectively. Right. As one preacher said, that, that marriage is actually heavenly sandpaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've always working, loved that. Yeah, and Working out the rough edges in both lives. In other words, it's a growth process, but ever so important is the commitment to one another and to the marriage. Remember the marriage vows. Now, in marriage vows, I like to say like uh, uh, to the woman uh, or to the man, rather, that it takes the woman to be his lawful wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part, according to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I pledge you my all. Now, that's commitment. A yeah, commitment that needs right. to be renewed in your mind and regularly, which is kind of a ministry of a wedding. I always point out to the couple, and when we when I perform a wedding ceremony as officiate, I like to mention that before they take their vows, those present that are hearing these vows from this man and woman are actually being ministered to to renew your vows that you've made to your spouse. Anyway, yeah, so that's... a renewal of your of your vows. Bring, Bring them out or talk to your minister that you might even have a uh, a ceremony. Sometimes it's just a private ceremony of renewing the vows and just kind of look at each other in the eye and renew those commitments that you made when you were first married. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's it, it's funny to me that um, oftentimes, you know, we um, look at things and we believe that God's the one doing it. You know, when it comes to relationships with other people, when it comes to specifically relationships with your wife, you know, all of those things are very detailed and spoken about in scripture. So when you're tempted, you're not being tempted by God. Um, when we pull ourselves away from what we know the definition of love is, what we know God has done as far as marriage is concerned and what it means and how it's, it's a vow, but it's a vow based on mutual, um, love, caring, understanding and action. Um, you know, a, a lot of times I know, I, I remember pastor Chris from, um, from, um, Skycrest Community Church down there in Clearwater. I remember him talking about um, in marriage counseling a lot of times, you know, they people would use as an excuse, well, God put such and such in my life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, the reality is, is when you compare that to what Scripture says about marriage, that's there's nothing more false than that. So yeah. you have to take ownership of the fact that you're the one straying from that and take action to get back on course, you know. Um so falling into that, you know, my spouse doesn't, you know, do what I expect them to do or want them to do. None of those things are loving, right? That's not patient. That's, that's right. not kind. That's not that's understanding. Right. That's not, that's not bearing all things that not, that's none of those things, you know? So, um, yeah, it's really important mentally just to get back to scripture and what we know to be the truth about the re about love and what God has said love is not what we have modern defined it as you know, as sexual attraction to each other. That's just, that's, that's right. And that's it's just all, not it, biblical. It's all based on commitment. I, I yeah. have to tell you this story. I think I've told you, but, uh, uh, Jan and I were at a wedding actually, uh, observing a wedding of some dear friends. And, uh, um, when they were taking their wedding vows, this was, about six months after my one breath from death experience, at which when I was one breath from death, Jan was by my side and stayed with me through that dark time. And so as as the couple was, was going over their vows and they came to that point where it says, uh, for richer or for poorer in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part, I said, you have lived that one out, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and that is 100% true. That's right. And yeah. I would tell you, Looking at from the outside, looking at you guys' relationship, um, man, you have been gifted with so many things by sticking to your vow and by doing the action and walking through it. I mean, you guys' relationship, I would argue, is way stronger because of that. Not, yeah, yeah, God has really blessed us, and we, yep. we give thanks to that. Or as my friend who's a a big time attorney in Washington, D.C. reminds me all the time when I talk to him, he said, Bob, you married up. 
<laughs> well, yeah, uh, you and I are both guilty of that. All right. So question number three, let's turn to the physical aspect of life. So let's talk about recovery. You and I have always notoriously, and I think it's a man thing. We don't really take recovery as seriously as we should. But um, what are some ways you have found that help in recovery from workouts or races or whatever it is that you do in training wise? All right. Yeah, I, I actually researched this a little bit. I, I listen to the podcast from Ben Greenfield Fitness all the time. And on BenGreenfieldFitness.com, he has some proven helps in recovery that he listed 12. Here's a few of these things I thought interesting. Actually, he said that fasting, believe it or not, fasting after a workout can actually help because your body will, it will try to uh, recover on its own and dig down deep for things. Wow. Not regularly, but once in a while, fasting. Protolytic em- enzymes seem to help. Also, natural anti-inflammatory foods such as pineapple, cherry juice, or ginger or beef. Beef, yeah. Yeah, hey, there, there you go. You go it's it. what's for dinner, and, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> also, essential amino acids or even having a deep tissue massage. That sounds pretty good. Or even using a foam roller. Yep. He even says that uh, it's been proven that inversion will help. You know, turn yourself upside down. <laughs> You know, I can see that, but I just, I can't find myself like, you know, buying one of those swing inversion, chair things. In, yeah, yeah, whatever. Inversion table. <laughs> inversion table. Uh, but also, table. Uh, he says that compression gear sometimes help. Anyway, anything yeah. that you've found to be helpful during recovery? I thought all those things in, in really are seem to be a good idea. What's no, you? I, thought, I thought they were great. I, I Fasting was a surprise for me. Um Proteolytic enzymes. What are those? I don't even know what they are. Uh, the enzymes that really help you. Um, it, it helps to digest food, but it also helps to uh, um, eliminate some of the lactic acid and some of the other things that oh. build up during during your workout. So, yeah, I would never have thought that, but they said that there's really a benefit for those enzymes. So anyway. are those something that you buy like in a supplement or are they in food? Yes. Do you have an yes. Ad- yeah. 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 Okay. It's a supplement. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I was like, wow. Now, the beef thing is super good news, and I'm going to celebrate that tonight with a steak. So that works out great. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. A, a JT steak just can't be beaten. Anyway, folks, check out the website uh, uh, that we're talking about uh, and check out our, 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 our thoughts on this because when we get down to it, you know, uh, to apply things to recover takes discipline. But as we point out each week, discipline does make the difference in all aspects of life. Check out today's show notes at bobbrewbaker.com. Click on the Power Break podcast. Today is show number 185. And submit your questions by email to jt at bobbrewbaker.com and listen to our answer on an upcoming Power Break podcast. And please, please, folks, please write to JT. He wants some mail at jt at bobbrewbaker.com. <laughs> yeah, you're Check just out making my retirement thing. easy, man. That's all you're That's doing. That's right. Yeah. Check out things that we talk about at BobRubaker.com. And while you're there, check out Strength Training for Your Love Life. You'll find it in the resources. It's the book that my wife and I put together just to help you in your love life, right? Strength Training for Your Love Life at BobRubaker.com. Well, thank you for joining us for the Power Break Podcast. Please subscribe and leave a review wherever you've downloaded the podcast. And check out show notes, news, Bob's weekly blog, and other cool things at BobRubaker.com. And listen next time for the Power Break Podcast.